française, c'est que vous donnez la priorité aux mots importants. Par exemple, vous ne dites pas « European Union euh, », vous dites « Union Européenne ». Et vous ne dites pas « semantique », mais vous dites « web sémantique ». Et en effet, le « web » est très important pour le « web sémantique ». Mais c'est bizarre qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui ne donnent pas la priorité au « web ». Et en fait, il y a beaucoup de gens dans la communauté qui ne comprennent pas vraiment ce qui c'est le « web ». Donc aujourd'hui, je vais vous parler du « web ». Et je vais le faire en anglais parce que c'est la langue qui mêle le web à ne fait pas d'abord. So, what I've seen a couple of months ago, was in September, I think, is this tweet. It's 1999. You went to computer science and have to decide whether you would change the world through AI or semantic web. Choose well, there's only one right choice. <laughs> because I had to reply, this came from a VP of Google somewhere. So yes, one of them is about centralized intelligence for the happy few, and the other one is about decentralized intelligence for all. What a tough choice. <laughs> Now indeed, if you think about this, web is the main thing, the main differentiator we have compared to other disciplines, compared to big data, AI, and so on and so forth. We also have to see the other side of this. It also means that if the things that we're doing don't work on the web, we have a serious problem, because if you don't do that, what's our advantage? What's the unique position that we have compared to the others? So today, I'll talk about those things. I'll start showing a couple of cases where <coughs> semantic web is not really used as a web. Then, I'll go on to how we can design clients which are intelligent users of service. And then, finally, I'll um, end with how we can measure our solutions to make sure that, indeed, they are working on web. So let's have a look at the kind of problems that we're seeing today. Where are the semantic web applications? Who of you has an app on their phone that works with semantic web? No, no it's, it's a server-side app. It's a server-side app. That's, that's close, that's close. It's, it's at least something, at least an app. You have something there? Yeah, simple though. All right. I'm talking about this idea. We'll come, great. But as you can see, this was not a convincing majority of the room, I would say. So why is that? This is strange, because I mean, if you look at all those apps, where are the powerful reasoning capabilities of Semantic Web? Why are they not using those? <coughs> because in the papers about the Semantic Web, we have excellent results for those. Where are the apps that query link data live from the web? I don't see them. It's strange, because it runs very well on our local machines. We all know it works. And which apps are using different sources of linked data to find an answer? Well, it works fine in university basements, so why doesn't it work on the public web? Interesting. The research that I'm doing at Ghent University focuses on bringing back the semantic web, on bringing the semantic web back to the web. So bringing the web back in semantic web, really emphasizing that part. <coughs> And some people said, well, yes, it's a matter of engineering. We've done all the research, now just we need a couple of engineers, and then magically it will work on the web. Well, not really, because it's not because it's fast and running well on your server that's also running well on the web. The second thing is that it's really a matter of redesigning. You have to think differently, because all of those papers that I'm reading, they typically say that speed is the most important thing. If you engineer for the web, you have to emphasize scale over speed. It's also a matter of measuring. It's also a matter of knowing, like, how can we be sure that this thing that we've built will also scale to the public web? So we should look at multiple dimensions, not just to the speed. And to do that, we're designing things that work like the rest of the web. Because sometimes I think the semantic web community suffers from the not invented here syndrome, right? We like to do things differently, but sometimes the web can be great inspiration for what needs to be done. As an example, do you know any regular web developer who would give public access to their My MySQL database? <laughs> somebody knows somebody who would do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> But really successful, we cannot call that, I think, right? Unless you know a successful example of this, well, they don't do this. What do they do instead? Well, they put an API in front of those MySQL servers to restrict the kind of queries you can do. That's very logical. Everybody else on the web, except me for a couple of junior developers, would totally agree on that. <laughs> so why would the same thing then suddenly work if we replace relational database by RDF? 
because this is what we're doing with Spark endpoints. Spark endpoints are just public databases on the web. Why would this work? Because it's RDF. Is this really the semantic web that makes everything just work? <laughs> I don't think so, but feel free to disagree. I think that public Spark endpoints do not scale at the moment, and they never will. And the second part is really important, because it means that it's a problem we cannot solve, no matter how hard we try. How about the situation? Well, if you look at public Spark endpoints, more than half of them have an uptime of less than 95%. You could say, well, 95%, that's not bad, um, but just know the rest of the web, they don't measure in percentages, they measure a number of nights, like 99.99% .99 is four nights of availability. So the fact that we're measuring in percentages already <coughs> says something about the state of affairs. Let me translate this into more concrete numbers. 95% means that one and a half day each month, the average Sparkle endpoint is not working. And this shows how problem problematic these numbers are. This means we cannot build reliable applications on top of the public endpoints that we have, because our applications could be done for at least one and a half days each month. That was acceptable. And the problem is inherent to having such complex interfaces. It's not even if we succeed in making Sparkle endpoints that say 10 times or 20 times or 100 times faster, we can always find queries that will bring them down. This is really by design. This is the important thing. Because some people still think, well, we thought apart, the research is there, just engineer the hell out of it and it will work on the web. It won't. It's just not possible with such an expressive interface. Just look at SQL databases. They have been around since, what, since the 70s? Nobody would put them on the web. So why would our RDF databases, who have been around for 10 years, be able to tackle that challenge? It's just not possible. And then, if you continue thinking, <coughs> the true potential of linked data is not in those single servers. It starts when we connect different databases together. The whole premise of linked data is about connecting things, about linking things together. And the problems get much and much worse if we want to query multiple data sets at the same time. It's simple maths. One data set is 95% of time. Well, with five, in the worst case, that's only 77% of time. This is like just three weeks out of the four we have in a month, this thing is working. It's totally unacceptable. Yet, remember where I started. The web is our main differentiator. It doesn't matter if it works in our basements. It doesn't matter if it works if we centralize everything onto one machine. We have no competition for fields like big data, machine learning, AI, and so on. If we're not thinking the web way, and web meaning different sources, it just doesn't matter. So this doesn't mean that we have to go back to hosting our private endpoints and give up the dream of a semantic web and just have a semantic basement, perhaps, or something. <laughs> I don't think so, or at least I hope that's not what will happen. Because again, I don't see how we could compare <coughs> other efforts such as big data and security code. It's a goodbye semantic web if we start going this route, because this is different, <coughs> right? So these were the negative parts about the current state of affairs, um, why I think we really have a problem. Because remember the tweet in the beginning, people really think now that those who chose the semantic web back then have made a mistake, that the other technologies have gone on. Yes, they have, but uh, if you look at what's happening with machine learning, it, it's really exciting what they can do, but at the same time, it's only exciting for those who have all the data, who harvest everything and then can do stuff on it. It's maybe bring money to, what, the 5% the of, of companies? The others just don't have the resources. So the web is really what we need to make work if you want to make a semantic web reality for all of us. So what I'm doing is I'm designing clients that are intelligent instead of servers that are intelligent. If you think about the history of LinkedIn so far, it has more or less been a story of two extremes. So either you offer a Spark an endpoint, but then you're stuck with a quite expensive server. Then availability might be an issue if you don't have the money for a very big cluster. Bandwidth is easy because you only get back results that you need, and the data is live. Those are the benefits of a Spark then. But <coughs> offer just for free a public Sparkle endpoint. It's really, really expensive. And by the way, I'm not against Sparkle endpoints. I'm not against SQL databases either. I just have serious questions with public Sparkle endpoints. So what happens in practice is that instead of offering Sparkle endpoints, lots of parties just give their data as data dump. They zip everything and there are the traffic. There you go. That's feasible, but it's kind of the opposite situation. 
there's not a high cost for the server, it's just the donors, but you have to have an expensive client because you need to have your own support for the right now. You can keep the availability as high as you want because you're in control, but at the same time, it's quite a lot of benefit. You have to get all triples, even if you're just interested in the very few. And then, of course, data gets outdated pretty fast because you always have to synchronize between the two sites. But these were the two options that have been around for a long time, more or less. Either you go all the way with the spot endpoints, or you go none of the way with the data and let the client just do whatever it needs to do. So what we've done is, we said, hey, if you think about it, actually there's lots of different possibilities in the middle. There's different kind of places on this imaginary axis where we could slightly change or compromise some of the characteristics to have a nicer mix of different things. And that's what we've called um, linked data fragments. So linked data fragments is just a framework to think about all possible interfaces that you could have on this axis. Why did we choose this name? Well, actually, if you think about it, what all those interfaces have in common, even those that don't exist yet, is that one way or another, they section up a big data set into certain pieces, certain fragments. Data dump is really simple, it's just a fragment of everything in the whole data set. The Spartan endpoint is much more interesting, it's a fragment that exactly corresponds to the results of the specific query that you ask. So these are very specific fragments, these are very generic fragments. So what we're looking for is compromises in between that will give us different combinations of those aspects. What we've done after that is designed a mix of those trade-offs and for us, it was really important that it was possible to have high availability with a low server cost. So we did not care at first about performance, availability, and low cost for the server were the main things. Because remember, our mission is to make the semantic web work on the web. And like I said in the beginning, if you want to engineer for these situations, you have to start from scratch and prioritize scale over speed. And that's what we did. We built an interface called Triple Pattern Frank. A triple pattern fragment interface has very low cost for the server, and instead of having the intelligence on the server, it tries to enable intelligence on the client side. And this is wholly different. So don't try to be intelligent for yourself as a server, try to enable others to do intelligent things. This sounds a bit abstract, so let me make it very concrete. Since it's on the axis, somehow we know that one way or another, this will give us certain fragments of the data set. And the fragments that we have, like the name Rona says, is triple patterns. So, this is the example of DBpedia, and how can we access it? Well, we can ask for any kind of triple pattern. In this case, I've asked for all those triples that have as predicate birthplace and have as object Paris. In other words, give me things born in Paris. These are the kind of questions that you can ask this server. So, any of those fields can be empty or full. For instance, if I take an example, um, let's take this wrapper, for instance, now I'm looking at uh, the patterns that have this as a structure. That's all I can ask, simple triple patterns. No more complex things, so no more complex Oracle queries. The benefit of this is that it's really, really cheap for the server to compute. You can really do this in an instant. And a couple of other things are also easy to compute. For instance, this is the, let me go back maybe to the um, previous thing that we had, so let me just show the fragment of everything. So this is the whole data set, but you might be surprised like why um, why is this still working? Well, this is because we paid the data set. So in this case, we're seeing all triples that are in there, but only the first 100 matches. And we see that in total, there's just over a billion triples right there. So we're able to expose very huge data sets at low cost. And in addition to the data, we also have kind of metadata informing the client how to make decisions. Because knowing whether a pattern is large or small can help you make decisions later if you need to query. So speaking of querying this, how, how do we approach this? Because even if a server interface is simple, we might want to ask more complex questions. Well, this is an example of a more uh, complex query. And this is a Sparkle query, and we're looking for the label of people who are artists, who are born in a certain city, and the city needs to be named Paris. In other words, we're looking for artists born in Paris. How can a client do this if the server-side interface is this simple? Well, actually, it's really easy if you think about it. All the client has to do is first ask the server, what do you have? In this case, the server will say, well, you can query by triple pattern. And then the client will split this Sparkle query into triple patterns and only ask triple pattern questions to the server. As you can imagine, this, which used to be one big question, 
now becomes also smaller questions, so we will need more bandwidth there. But it's not too dramatic, in fact, let me show you this in action. Here is the client which runs completely in the browser, so no service has script here right there. I have the same query, and I want to ask it over DBP again. So when I click execute, the results will start coming in right there. So let's do that. And there you go, you see the results coming in. These are all artists born in Paris. <laughs> so there's 100 results because I put a limit on the query and it took five seconds. So a couple of conclusions here. First of all, this is slower than a Sparkle endpoint. This took five seconds. A Sparkle endpoint would do this in 0 0.5 seconds, if you're lucky, which means 95% of time. <laughs> this thing is slower, but the server is much lower cost, so it's easier to have it at high availability. So that's the trade-off that we're making. We're sacrificing great performance for the gain and availability that we have. Even though it took five seconds for all 100, you might have seen that the first results started flowing in already. So it's a streaming system. So even though we don't have all the results yet, we already have the first group of results. <laughs> and if you want to look down, right below you see the execution log, which shows us all the smaller questions that the client was automatically firing in order to reply to the complex group. And maybe something interesting, underneath the hoop, the metadata that I've shown you, like the number of matches per pattern, is used for query optimization. Because if you <coughs> execute the sub-questions in the wrong order, it might take five days instead of five seconds. So all of these things are happening underneath the hoop because we have an interface that enables the client to do intelligent things, instead of trying to do intelligent itself. And the cool thing is that things like these also scale to multiple endpoints. There's no reason why it would not do this. Instead of asking those questions to a single server, you can just ask them to multiple servers. And this all works. And this is going to be a federated query live from stage. So the situation is, we need some imagination. I'm standing in front of Harvard Library, and I'm curious to know which books do you have that were authored by people born in Paris. So let's see what happens. If I click Execute Query, three databases are being asked for results. We have Wikipedia, who knows about people born in Paris. We have VIOF, which knows about people and their works. And we have Harvard Library, which knows about the books at Harvard Library. And this is all streaming. And as you can see, we've been running now for almost 20 seconds, and we have over 600 results. So this is federated query happening live in the browser. And let me just check how many of you have actually executed a federated query before. <coughs> That's quite a couple, still more than people who have semantic web apps. <laughs> How many of you have executed federated queries on the live public web? Live public web, well, yeah. Alright, still a couple, that's interesting. Well, I tweeted a link to my slides. If you go to this slide, you can all do it, and you can go home and tell everybody you've executed a federated query on the live web. It's <laughs> super exciting, so please do this. I'm going to stop it right here. So what you can see is that with intelligent clients, scaling up to multiple servers, lots of clients, is not a problem at all. But of course, being a researcher, I still have to prove this. I still have to measure that solutions like these indeed are web scale. And this brings us to an interesting point, because it all depends on your expectations. I've done this demo a couple of times live on stage, and last time I got a very interesting reaction. Okay, a thousand results in 55 seconds. That's why nobody wants federated search. Fair enough. But you know me, I replied to this thing, obviously. <laughs> I'd argue it's fantastic. Don't tell me you have ever read those types of results in 55 seconds. That's like 20 results per second. Nobody can read that fast. And also, it's streaming again. I know it's slower, but you have also have to think about the benefits that we gain. This is multi-source too. This is not the filter bill where only one source gives us the information. This is from the live web. So we pay in query speed, but I would say it's still fast enough for the use case. And at the same time, we have this multi-source truth. We have information from the different sources being combined live. Now, that said, there's no silver bullet. There's no, there's no one way to say whether something is good. As I told you, most papers focus on execution time, but what good is an execution time? Because you can always make it better if you centralize. And if it doesn't work on the public web, well, there goes our competition. So to build a semantic web, we need to ask the important questions. How does it scale? What does it cost to scale? And do the important results arrive soon? That's a completely different question. So we've measured this. What we've done is we've done a brilliant Sparkle benchmark, and we had a maximum 240 simultaneous clients. We had one cache and one server. And then we measured how do the, server, uh, the servers compare if it's a Sparkle endpoint versus a DPF. So. 
What we saw is that while well, the throughput is lower, so this is a logarithmic graph, and the lines above, they're sparkle endpoints, and obviously it's only one client, we see two magnitude difference. They're executing much, they're much more queries per hour, but if we <coughs> increase the number of clients, you see that the performance sparkle endpoints comes crashing down. This is logarithmic, so it really comes crashing down. And I'm not interested in being the fastest, I'm interested in scaling, and as you can see, we scale it down. That's something very interesting right there. If you look at the traffic arriving at the server, well, obviously we need more bandwidth, but it might not have been as much as we expected. We're looking at four megabytes for our client server system and half or a quarter of that for the other solution. Why is that? Well, the cache is taking most of the traffic. Because if you split complex questions into sub-questions, the chance that somebody else will have the same sub-question is much higher. So the reuse is much better, just like the rest of the web. The rest of the web also doesn't answer very, very specialized queries. We all reuse bits of information to find an answer. And this graph shows that it's actually good. And also, if you look at the server, we're using much less CPU. So this means that with the same server, we can serve much more clients. This is web scale. And you can see, it's a matter of engineering. No matter how fast the spot the endpoints are going to get, the behavior will always be the same. So this is really important that we also look at this from this one. And then, for me, the kill use case is really federation. So forget about the, the multiple clients and single endpoint. It's really about multiple clients, multiple endpoints. This is what Lane Data is best at. So we had a question and the results do we have to the extent to federation as well. We first with a federated benchmark and we compared state-of-the-art federation with nine sparkle endpoints with our setup with nine TPF interfaces. And very important, the first thing we ran on a closed network, so in a university basement, so to speak. The second test with TPF was run over the public web because it just doesn't make sense to try to test TPF in a basement. This is really made for the public web. And the results were quite interesting. This is performance that we're looking at, query execution speed. What you see, the gray bars, they are state-of-the-art federation engines with Sparkle endpoints with really, really heavy interfaces. And you can see that actually, even performance-wise, the big difference is gone. Now, this doesn't generalize to all queries, but the same can be said about the uh, federation Sparkle endpoints. They have trouble with some queries, we have trouble with some queries. But this really shows that federation is a game changer because federation is really thinking at web scale. And if we start to measure at a web scale, we really see the influence of having lightweight interfaces. In fact, having a more heavy interface on the server side doesn't help you at all. So I've talked about um, the problems that we have if the semantic web doesn't work on the web. I've talked about the design for intelligent clients and servers that enable clients to be intelligent. And then I've explained that we need to measure differently as well. So what can we conclude from that? First of all, the solution that we propose, you've seen a big axis, well, the one dot there, this is not the final answer. I'm not claiming that this is the best thing ever. Because publication and query execution over IDF will always have trade-offs. Some will be slow, some will be fast, some will have high bandwidth, some will have low bandwidth, and so on and so forth. There's no final answer right there. But this experiment shows that even if you make the interface on the server very, very simple, what can happen? So imagine if you start looking at the other points of the axis. And my belief is that if you want to see intelligent clients, which is what the semantic web is all about for me, we should stop <coughs> building intelligent servers. It's not going to happen if the servers are intelligent. Server-side intelligence simply doesn't scale. And this is, I think, one of the causes why the semantic web is still problematic and a stake-up. I think we need to look at much more scalable solutions. Client-side intelligence is much harder. Like decentralized intelligence is a totally new problem that's not really tackled at a big scale in the AI community at the moment. So it's really a niche that we can have lots of advantages in that. But the key to that is that the server and the client should work together. So instead of being intelligent, the server enables clients to be intelligent by giving them access to the right kind of data, the right kind of questions, and the right kind of metadata. All this is really important. In our publications, you'll see more about how we design the conversation between the clients and the server for intelligence. And my challenge to all of you and to researchers interested in exploring this is start looking at the other points. It's not about Sparkle and it's not about data dumps. It's not even about what I propose. It's really about what happens if we make the server slightly simpler, if we make the, the clients slightly more intelligent. What happens with the bank? What happens with the query execution? It's these kind of trade-offs that we need to explore such that we find good solutions for particular use cases. 
And depending whether you have a lot of money or whether you're on a restricted budget, you might need to choose different points for the exit. But when you engineer solutions like these, there's one question that's really, really important. Does it work on the web? Is it really possible to scale this out of a data set? And by always asking this question, I think we'll arrive at a semantic web where the web is put first. Thanks.